Welcome to the Three Things Podcast. I'm David Iglesias, Director of Wheaton Center for Faith, Politics, and Economics. You may be wondering why this podcast is called Three Things. You were probably taught by your parents, like I was, that it was impolite to talk to people about three things, religion, politics, and money. But what happens if your job is to talk about those three things? Well, join me for the next 25 minutes and let's find out. Today's guest is Bonnie Wurzbacher. She received her BA from Wheaton College and her MBA from Emory University. She has a long history of serving at the highest levels of both profit and nonprofit organizations. First, she spent 28 years with a Coca-Cola company where she rose to the rank of Senior Vice President, Global Customer Leadership, and a Corporate Director where she was responsible for a $1.6 billion in global revenue. Bonnie later served as Chief Development Officer for World Vision International, where she was responsible for the stewardship and growth of a $2.8 billion revenue. She and her husband, Steve, are parents to a son and grandparents as well. Bonnie serves on the Board of Advisors for the Wheaton Center for Faith, Politics, and Economics. Thank you for joining me today, Bonnie. You're welcome. Thank you for having me, David. So, um, we know each other. You've taught at uh, some of the classes here at Wheaton. And uh, as I recall, you started college at the age of 16, is that correct? That's right. Can you tell me about what, what that was like? Because most people start when they're older. Yeah. Well, it, I felt older <laughs> than I was, but in retrospect, I realized that I really was quite young. Um, I grew up, I'll tell you a little bit about my background that will get me to why I went there. I, I grew up as a PK and um, in the Chicago and Milwaukee area, mostly Milwaukee. And um, my parents met at Wheaton. Ah. And I had a lot of family that went to Wheaton. I had two other sets of aunts and uncles that went there. I had my sister, my old, older sister. There's only two of us went there as well as eight cousins. So I grew up wanting to go to Wheaton. So that was part of what got me there early. Um, I had a pretty normal life for a PK anyway, um, more church than most people would be comfortable with, but you know, it was just school and church and play and church and friends and church. <laughs> but I spent a lot of time there. Um, and you know, singing in the choir. I was athletic. I did a lot of outdoor things with my dad. But one of the things that I think um, I saw, one of the things that really shaped some of my choices in my career and probably the development of some of my gifts and talents was we always had people at our house, either from the church or visitors to the church. And I was the one that would sit in the living room with my dad and visit with them and talk with them while my older sister and my mom would cook dinner. And I got very interested in people from lots of different places and, and talking with people. And mm -hmm. um, I think that just kind of contributed to the decisions I made about, about business and other things um, in, in going on. Um, I also was quite entrepreneurial as a little girl. I um, did all kinds of things to make money and to perform and to do creative things. And um, I, I do think that when you look back at your childhood, it's one of the things that helps you recognize where some of your natural gifts and abilities are. Yes. So anyway, back, back to six. Go so ahead. This is beyond the lemonade stand. You were making money as a young kid. Is that right? Not, not any big money, but I, I was doing magic shows and puppet shows and musicals and um, those sorts of things, like creative, entrepreneurial, um, small sorts of things, like babysitting for money, sure, dog walking, um, but nothing, nothing seriously. And not, I don't think it was really just about the money. I think it was for the creativity and ingenuity and community that it built and um, a lot of other things as I look back at what it was in me doing that. 
anyway, um, I had the chance to graduate early from, I, I started a little bit early in school and if I graduated a year early, I would have been only 16 and a half at the time. And I decided that if I could get into Wheaton, I would. And if I couldn't, I'd wait another year and give it another shot. And um, I got in. I, I, I think I was interviewing when I was barely 15. Oh my, that's incredible. <laughs> but um, so, yeah, I was quite young when I went. And um, there were some challenges with that, of course, as you would expect. Well, sure. Um, and as I recall, you were a business major or, or an econ major? Neither. I Your was actually an education. education major. Ah, oh, that's right. A lot of people, and in fact, I, I taught school for five years um, in the Chicago Public Schools um, after Wheaton, and then a, lot, a lot of people forget that. One of the, I think that one of the most interesting things about my career actually was that I taught school, a, a government job, if you will. Um, then I was for five years, then I was in business for 30 years, 28 of those years with the Coca-Cola company, and then in the nonprofit world with World Vision International. So, and um, I thoroughly enjoyed all of them. And I definitely used all the skills I had developed in the previous role or work in the next role, even when it was changing industries. So can you take me back to the moment you decided to leave education and go into business? What, what prompted that change? Yeah. Well, a couple of things. Um, I went into education partly because my mom was a teacher and I had a lot of teacher friends and role models. Um, you know, back when I graduated from Wheaton, which was in 1977, there weren't that many women that did things outside of teaching, nursing, administration, a little bit. My, my roommate became an attorney. That was, that was very unusual back then. Um, but I really, I really thought I would enjoy teaching and really thought that I would marry when I got out of Wheaton shortly thereafter and raise a family and it would be great to have a job like that that you could do part-time and I, I didn't really have a long-term serious career ambition and um, so I went into teaching and I and I enjoyed it mm -hmm. so the point of why I left um, after five years when I didn't marry my Wheaton sweetheart <laughs> and, and clearly wasn't going to get married anytime soon, um, I just started thinking more seriously about my career. And um, there were things I loved about teaching and there were things mostly about the system that I didn't like, about the unions and, and other things. Mm -hmm. And I had a number of um, friends in business that encouraged me to try it. And I got to the point where I wanted to try something else to either decide then to go back, be committed to teaching and go, go get my master's and do something, maybe get into administration or something or um, change direction completely. Mm -hmm. And I interviewed everywhere I could that summer and I ended up accepting a job with a small uh, food it was called the food broker. They, mm -hmm. they represented various food manufacturers in sales in Chicago and took that job. And two and a half years later, Coke recruited me from there. Oh, so you got And I loved business. Uh -huh. And well, obviously you were, the, you were in the business world for a long time and you climbed to a very high level of business. Uh, can you share any tips to, to, to young business persons who are working for a large corporation uh, how they can maybe follow in your steps and get to a high level as well? Well, um, I often encourage people to start out their careers with large corporations. They tend to have more, more jobs. They have lots of resources. They often have good training programs. And one of the reasons I stayed with Coca-Cola for so long was I was with them in a place that they're both their national and global headquarters are in Atlanta um, that 
allowed me to do all kinds of different jobs. I think I had 12 or 13 jobs maybe over the 28 years that I was with them, maybe, maybe 11, but a number of them. Um, so I think a, corp a corporation is a great place to get started in work, in a, a business career. I think the best advice I can give about climbing a corporate ladder is to do a great job where you are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, to do your work with excellence, to value the people around you, to um, use your gifts and abilities, and to remember that it's not all about uh, your results, it's also about your relationships. Well, that's, that's really great advice. Um, and I've, I've heard other senior leaders from other sectors say similar things, especially about the importance of relationship. Um, that you can't just, uh, I mean, obviously the bottom line is important, but how you treat people is also important. Well, it is, and, and business fundamentally is engaging with other people around a common objective and purpose and using the gifts and abilities of everyone and, and, and the functions and jobs that they're in to, to be successful. Uh, so I worked much more closely with people in business than I ever did in teaching. Teaching was a little bit more, while well, there were other teachers most of the day, you know, I was teaching fourth grade. I was in my classroom with my kids, and while I worked with the students, I didn't work nearly as much in teams as I did when I was at, uh, at the Coca-Cola company. That's fascinating. So you've, I think you've already said that uh, women executives uh, were not that common in the late 1970s, early 1980s. Uh, is it a lot more common now to, to have women at all levels? Well, the they weren't. And what I was saying back at Wheaton, there weren't a lot of women going into non-traditional mm -hmm. male-oriented, obviously, um, roles and, and industries. Um, not that it, you know, I think it was beginning to change. The real issue was, and perhaps still is, but I think this is improving, not so much the number of women in a certain company, but what fields they went into within those organizations and uh, how many were in leadership roles. So I was fortunate in that I entered Coca-Cola with their, was with their juice division called Coca-Cola Foods in sales. That's what I went into when I left teaching, um, partly because I thought I would be good at it and partly because I didn't want to have to go back and get my master's in business or more education in it until I was sure I, would, I enjoyed business and, and wanted to stay in it. Um, and so that was a field that there were very few women in. Uh, most of the women at Coke were in support, more support kind of roles, even if it wasn't like administration or an admin assistant kind of a role, it would be, it would tend to be more of a human resources or finance or a little bit more behind the scenes supporting salespeople and different leaders. Um, and, and that wasn't it, pretty much by coincidence wasn't the field I went into. So um, I was one of the very few women and very often the only woman for many, many years. Um, but that changed quite meaningfully and I felt like I had a hand in helping to contribute to it, not only by the work that I did, but by the things that I helped cope with as well. Well, exactly. And I think you shared something uh, with my Faith in the Marketplace class a year or two ago that you, you learned to lower your voice a pitch or two so you would be well, heard in business meetings. I, I mean, can you kind of give us a little more uh, yeah. background? It wasn't, it wasn't lowering my pitch. And this came from an, an early communications class that Coca-Cola sent its young up-and-coming leaders to. Uh, it was called Speakeasy, and it was a four-day program. It wasn't specifically for women, but one of the things they pointed out was that women often end their sentences with an upward inflection. Yes. So, do you know what I do? You know what I mean by that? I have a daughter that does yeah. that. I'm trying to break her of that. Yes. 
And it sounds like it's normal to do that when you're asking a question. But some people do it, and women tend to do it more often when they're not asking a question, just when they're, because it kind of softens their, their voice, maybe. I, I think for most of us, we don't even realize we're doing it. But it takes some authority out of the sound of your voice, and it makes you sound tentative rather than more certain of what you're saying. And so that was just a really little technique. There were others that, that I paid attention to. Um, to make it clear when I was asking a question and when I wasn't. <laughs> so um, that actually, there were, there were sort of three, when I was at Coke, and I would say, you know, not the whole time, but in the last five or six years that I was there, the, the most current research about what held women back was, and I am not sure that it's necessarily these three anymore, but the first was leadership style mm -hmm. that included communication style. Mm -hmm. That, you know, the styles that were accepted for leaders were established by men. And so if you spoke different or and dressed different or, you know, engaged people differently, it was it was harder for some people to accept. And a lot of men had never worked even with a woman as a peer, much less for a woman. So there was a little bit of resistance to, to women in leadership too, sometimes not even knowingly, kind of un, mm -hmm. un, unintended biases, sure. I, I would say. Uh, and so that was at work. And then the third thing were, was family demands, that many con uh, companies were not very family friendly. Mm -hmm. um, and it it was really a, more of a sacrifice often for women because it was more likely that they had a a lot of other child care and um, home care and husband care and home responsibilities when they got home from work. And so not only did that have them working all the time, what I saw is that often um, women would forego the opportunity to either have, go to dinners or things where you built relationships outside of the workplace because they needed to get home. And men often had a little more flexibility uh, in that regard. So those were sort of the three biggest barriers broadly that were sort of well, well known. And we sort of worked on each of them at Coke. That's fascinating. And I, I know that a lot of business is conducted on the golf course. Uh, so a lot of my male friends who are in business, that's, that's where they relax and they get to schmooze. And, you know, I, I, I don't know if women are, are as uh, common on the golf course as, as men are. Yeah. Uh, maybe that's changed. Well, I'm a big golfer and I learned to golf through work when I, when I was um, running, running the McDonald's account. Actually, just before I was running that, I was working on it and uh, in sales. And uh, that was my biggest sale, by the way, but that's another story for maybe later in the interview. Sure. Um, and that's when I learned to play. But I actually don't think much business gets done on the golf course. What does happen, though, is that people bond. Golfing is a big friendship building activity. And it's the kind of thing you can do for work. It's a kind of a, at work, through work, often they're fundraisers or uh, maybe you're members at the same golf course or um, it's a, it's a friendship building opportunity. Um, if you're not already a good golfer, it's, it's not that common for men and women unless they are friends or know each other to play that much golf together. Um, so I say find ways to build those relationships um, that are, you know, it might be through golf, it could be through any number of things, just to say that relationships are important. And the higher you go in an organization, the more important they are. Right. And I, and I know, I think you know that I come from a military background. So in the military world, it's, it's, it's running. So that's, that's where the relationships get built. Yeah. You might talk, you, you might talk shop example. or you might not. But when you go for a five mile run with your boss, you're going to talk about a lot of different things and you're going to be gone about an hour. Absolutely. Yeah. So tell me whether or not you believe in the existence of what some people call a glass ceiling. Do you think that exists or existed? I 
don't. I, I, I think that it was a term intended to say that there's something that's keeping women from breaking, really breaking through to that next level. I, I, and I, so I understood what was meant by it. But I don't really think that's it. I think it's understanding what it is, the issues, the three I mentioned were th really three that we were working on. But what is it that keeps um, women from going into the roles that lead to greater responsibility, being successful in those roles, developing the network of relationships and people that can help sponsor and advocate for them. Some of the, what you might consider unwritten rules of business that, um, I don't know if they're exactly a rule, but that you really do need someone to take you under their wing and help you along. And if everyone above you doesn't look like you, right. it's harder to get that kind of mentoring and coaching. It's always easier for women too, to um, coach and mentor and bring along people that are like them. It's just human nature. Right. People that, you know, they have a lot in common with uh, and they know and like and work with. So you just have to build, you have to intentionally build those connections, um, seek out the right roles, um, seek out um, people that will encourage you and mentor you and sponsor you. So here we are in 2020, we have women who are now at the highest levels of government and business. Um, and as you know, here at Wheaton, uh, the business econ department is our largest department. We've got over 400 undergrads. Uh, would you give any different advice to a young Wheaton senior, for example, going into, wants to work for a Fortune 500 company? just based on their gender, or would you give them the same advice? I, I think I'd give them the same advice, but I think I would um, speak to the importance of, of women being leaders, strong leaders everywhere. To women, but but actually, I would also have a similar message to that. When I speak on this subject, I try to speak to mixed groups of men and women. Right. I think maybe you heard me on that panel. We uh, we both work. Who does the laundry last yes. year? Yes. Yes. And we asked the original idea of whoever came up with it was that we get the women together, and some. And I do try to meet with groups of women whenever I come to Wheaton. I love to do that. But when you're talking about women in the workplace. It's really important to have men and women both hear the same message because mm -hmm. it's good for both of them. And the reason it is, it's good for women to be there, there to be more women in the workplace, more successful women in the workplace, because it's an indicator of a company that has more of a meritocracy mm -hmm. that is promoting based on accomplishment and performance, not just on who you know. When, and, and that is good for all high performers. It's good for men high performers too. Men want to work in more of a meritocracy too, who doesn't? Where you're recognized for your work, not just for the quote unquote politics of right. an organization. And you know that's discouraging for everyone. So um, the other thing is that men and women need to learn to work together and support each other. That's um, one of the things I've always promoted is, um, you know, one of the first things women did in my era was form women's forums and employee groups and things. And, and there was some value in that. It helped you to get to know the other women better. But what we really needed was forums like that for men and women to be together and to get to know each other professionally in a, a good and business setting that allows you to socialize. Mm -hmm. And some people have more opportunities for that than others. But um, if you're in, in business, you're going to have to work with men. And men, you're going to have to work with women. And you need to learn to be good um, peers and, and business, business peers to each other. Well, that's exactly right. Uh, so let, let me, uh, I've been asking some kind of big picture questions. I'm going to ask you a really easy question. Um, 
What are some things about Coca-Cola that some people may not know? This can be serious or this can be whimsical? Well, there's, there's a lot of things about Coca-Cola that some people may not know. Um, and I did not know many of them when I joined the company. I like to tell the story um, that when I joined them I, and I was offered a job in national account sales with Coca-Cola Coca Foods that makes Minute Maid. And at the time they also had a coffee division. And I did it under the condition that I would never have to sell Coca-Cola. <laughs> Seriously. Fascinating. And they said, well, you don't have to sell Coca-Cola. <laughs> you're, you're being hired to sell Minute Maid. And I thought, okay, great. You know, because I, I couldn't find anything really redeeming about selling brown sugar water, but I kind of justified in my mind that, well, orange juice has at least some nutritional value. And, you know, I thought just strictly of the product. I had no idea what the mission of the organization was or how, what they contributed to the world. Do you know what the mission of the Coca-Cola company is? Uh, gee, I don't know. Make a profit? Uh, I have no idea. <laughs> well, they do want to make a profit or they would go out of business. But their mission is to refresh the world create, and to create value that makes a difference everywhere they engage. Okay. So this is how they do it. Give me, bear with me for just a minute. This is some of the things I learned that I think people won't know. It's, I would call it what their multiplier factor is. Mm -hmm. So the Coca-Cola system is comprised of the company and its franchise bottlers, of which there are about roughly 300 now all over the world. They make and sell hundreds of refreshing and affordable non-alcoholic beverages, soft drinks, juices, teas, coffees, sports drinks, water, mostly ready to drink sorts of beverages. They do this in every single country in the world but one. In fact, 80% of their business is outside of the United States and was like that ever since I had joined the company. They're 100 and over 130 years old, I think 137 years old. Oh my. Very few companies are that old. Um, so that work, that selling those products around the world, making and selling and distributing them, generates roughly a million jobs between the company and its bottlers worldwide directly. But for every one job they create directly, they create 10 indirectly. That's part of this multiplier effect factor. So for example, in Africa, um, where Coca-Cola is the Coca-Cola is the continent's single largest employer directly. And then for every one job directly that they uh, create another 16 are created because of the informal small businesses down there the distributors and the retailers and all the other jobs that indirectly are impacted mm. so um, that's one of the things um, the fact that they have these local bottling partners also makes them far more local than global people think of this behemoth big Coca-Cola company, and they are big, but they don't make it here in the United States and or in a, even in a few optimized factories around the world and ship it out. They make it in every single country that they serve, in 900 bottling plants, in 200 countries, over 200 countries, by 300 different local bottlers. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So the vast majority of the money, the profit made, well over 90% of the, of the profit made stays in that country. It's made there and it's sold there. And not just the profit from Coke, but, but everything else. So um, um, it, let, let me just give you an example. Sure. To clarify it a little bit. The last year that I worked at Coke, which was 2012, um, the company spent three and a half billion dollars in salaries and benefits, the so jobs, compensation. But they also spent three billion in shareholder dividends. Plus, they created billions more in stock appreciation. So this is to investors and families and pension funds and everybody that owns Coca-Cola stock. So that's another form of value creation. 
They spent $10 billion on purchasing local supplies and capital improvements, so the generating it in, with other companies. They spent $2 billion in income taxes to the government. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't take into account the many billions more that were generated in local sales taxes through the sales of the finished products through the bottlers, nor any of the economic footprint of the bottlers themselves, nor the millions of dollars that they and all of their employees and all of the bottlers and all of their employees give away to philanthropic causes. That's called a multiplier factor. So it goes way beyond the value of just the product or the service itself, or even just the jobs created directly, to jobs created indirectly, and to revenue flowing and between businesses. And this, David, this is what we're experiencing right now right. in the midst of this whole lockdown, quarantine, shutting down. Mm -hmm. you, can, you can see it, and, and I'll... I'd like to get to the theology of business in a minute, then, then it, because it relates to that. But you can see how interdependent businesses are with each other. Right. Nonprofits are with businesses. Governments are with businesses. Businesses are with governments. They're very interconnected. And you can't just shut down businesses and have the rest of the world continue on, but the world just doesn't work without successful, sustainable business. It sounds like there's a lot of interconnecting webs. Um, and Apple, uh, the company is doing what Coke's been doing for a hundred plus years is they create a product that has this, this ripple effect that affects all these other companies that are, that are there to support the product. Every business has a multiplier factor, David. Mm -hmm. Every single su successful business has what I just described, this um, creating economic growth and value, not only within their business, but outside the business in their community. Just some do it on a bigger scale. And Coca-Cola and Apple happen to do it on a super big scale. But the smallest of businesses also does that, right. just in their community. So in the case of Coca-Cola, it makes a refreshing, drinkable product that's non-alcoholic. That's just the top of the, of the iceberg. There's this massive. Sub That's just the product. Yes. But you know what? That is the tip of the iceberg. But, I, but don't underestimate it because every organization, every for-profit, and I would argue maybe even non-profit, has to, but let's just stick with business for this example, has to have a product or service that people, value, people want and need and value and will pay for. Right. If they don't, they won't be in business. So while it might be the tip of the iceberg, there's no iceberg without that tip. <laughs> right, right. No, that, and, and that makes perfect sense. Join us for a second podcast with Bonnie Wurzbacher, where she shares her transition from the corporate world at Coca-Cola to the world of nonprofits at World Vision. She will also share her insights on the intersection of faith at work. You've been listening to a podcast from the Wheaton Center for Faith, Politics, and Economics. You can find us at wheaton.edu slash fpe.